Shalom and welcome. Listening to Temple Talk from the Temple Institute in Jerusalem. Today, the 12th day of the month of Menachem Av, the Consoling Father, 5775. It's July 28th, 2015, and this week's Parsha, Torah portion of Ve'et Hanan, this coming Shabbat. Here we are with the fast of Tisha B'Av behind us, the solemn national day of mourning that was observed this past Sunday, July 26th. I think that it was um, different from other fasts of Tisha B'Av that, that I remember, and I mean in a very positive way, the very vast amounts of Jews that turned out many, many hundreds, as many as 800, even a thousand more Jews that came in uh, tremendously difficult uh, hot weather that came to stand and wait to be able to go up to the Temple Mount. That was amazing. It was so encouraging. I myself got there at about 6.30 in the morning, an hour before opening time, and we had uh, prayer service outside the entrance to the Temple Mount, and we weren't even sure, is it going to open? Isn't, gonna, isn't it going to open? There have been years that the police haven't let us go up at all, and Muslims have been calling for um, confrontation and to stop the Jews from, from going up. And uh, we did get up. In fact, I was um, privileged to be in the first group that got up. And not only that, but we saw that the police made tremendous efforts to ensure that the Jewish uh, visitors were able to uh, come up. And I want to really acknowledge that they were out in full force and um, they did meet with a lot of resistance, a lot of incitement, and some violence they met with from the, the, the Muslims on the Temple Mount. But they basically um, allowed the... But they basically um, made arrangements for the, the Jewish people to be able to visit. And uh, there were several, several times during the day when... Uh, it was uh, closed temporarily. There were times when um, access was uh, somewhat curtailed, but basically we were able to visit the Temple Mount. And another novel thing that we had this year that never happened before, which was amazing, was that due to the efforts of a, a group of uh, young, young activist students, there was a live stream broadcast the entire uh, time of the Jewish ascents the, in the morning and the early afternoon to the Temple Mount. And people everywhere were able to follow the, uh, the path of the Jewish worshipers on the Temple Mount, follow the experience, and it, and it gave such a connection to people, to the idea of what we were feeling in our hearts, what we were going through, what we were experiencing on Tisha B'Av. And I have to tell you, it was, it was very, very encouraging to see the throngs of Jews who came from all over the country to go up to the mountain and Yitzchak, as usual. The main point of consolation, the main point of encouragement, the main point of strength is, to tell you the honest truth, I looked around and said, what? I'm like the oldest person here mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. at one point. And then, of course, there were many, many grandparents and older people that came. But in, in my group, for example, whoa, I remember when we used to come years and years ago, um, and there were so few. There were so few Jews that came. There were, and it was such an uphill battle. And I'm telling you, I didn't know who these kids were, where they were coming from, out of the woodwork. So many from all over the country, just throngs and throngs of these beautiful, healthy young people. That healthy meaning that they have their heads on straight. That they're that they're not buying what they're being sold about, about the temple being a thing of the past or not being relevant. It, you could just see how how they're so connected, and they and this to them is is to Shaba Av, you know, like the children already. Like what? It's broken, so you come back in with your tools. <laughs> like why aren't you fixing it? Like what? You're sitting on the floor and crying and mourning. Let's go. Let's go to the to the mount, and it was absolutely amazing. And yes, the the Muslims were quite uppity, quite confrontational, quite in our faces. It's coming to a, some kind of a, a boiling point. And in fact, uh, this week, um, there was a, a, an actual physical confrontation yesterday uh, that we 
posted on the Temple Institute's Facebook page where Waqf guards actually began kicking and hitting some Jewish visitors. It's, it goes on and on. It goes on and on. Uh, the radical, he's called radical, but he's actually mainstream Muslim cleric, Sheikh Rayed Salah, the uh, leader of what they call the northern branch of the of the Islamic resistance movement, he got into the news by stating the Muslims have to reconquer the Temple Mount and we have to stop these these incursions of of the Jews. I saw in the, in the news today that the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan is very very angry about the violations. They're calling it violations that hundreds of Jews visited the Temple Mount on their day of mourning, and of course. Uh, we have this uh, Arab Knesset member who was also in the news stating that the temple never existed, and um, and on it goes. So this war of th of the spirits of of the spiritual content of and of the direction of where we're going as a people and what we're confronting, it is just uh, so real and so palpable, and it's maybe on the one hand very much uh, epitomized by uh, another short clip very short that we posted um, on our temple institute facebook page that you can see of a jew in a group sitting down suddenly on the temple mount and reciting shema yisrael which is in this week's torah portion deuteronomy 6 reciting hero israel the lord our god the lord is one out loud and how in nanoseconds he is rushed by the Israel police and grabbed and taken off the mountain and I guess he was he was prosecuted I don't know what what the final outcome was of his case and I want to say another thing uh, and 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 that is just such a window into the into the soul of what's going on here that that Jew and, and you have to understand I mean you have to understand if you've been following our reports. If you've been following our Temple Institute updates and the Temple Institute Facebook page and website, then you know that when we go up there j as Jews, humbly, and I say that w and seriously, and with humility, with uh, a one goal in our hearts, and that is to be seen on this place, the only holy place in the world, by God, to try to utter a prayer, at the very least to have a prayer in our hearts. And when you see the confrontation, when you see the the tremendous animosity, violence, incitement to murder that we face by the Muslims, men, women, and children, constantly when we go there, then you understand what an, what an act of defiance it is, what an act of, of uh, piety it is for this Jew to have recited Shema, knowing full well what would happen to him. But what I want to add, having told you about the Sheikh Raid Salah, may his name rot, who called for the Muslims to conquest, uh, conquer the Temple Mount, and, and mentioning to you the Arab Knesset members who take their allegiance and vows to the State of Israel and then go and um, try to dismantle it from within. And when I tell you about all these things, but you know what? It was reported in the Hebrew press, which we translated and posted for you on the Temple Minister Facebook page, that an interview, right, with some of the policemen that serve on the Temple Mount, and it was talking about how the policemen say they are extremely embarrassed, frustrated, and and um, bewildered by the fact that they have to do this. And there was a policeman who was saying, we have tears in our eyes when we have to take a Jew off the Temple Mount. They were saying this anonymously, you know, the, without revealing their names, in order to protect their jobs, but also to be able to really, uh, you know, reveal their their hearts right uh, and that was a, just a such a, 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 a an empowering you know like um, what do I want to say that was such a feeling of um, the of validation that it's not we're not crazy that there's something so wrong with this picture that even these men that you know they find themselves in this horrible situation they are admitting there's something so wrong with these orders and of course, again, it has to do with uh, Jordan. It has to do with all the intrigues and all the political machinations that you that you want, as far as uh, Israel's alliances, whatever. It isn't going to last. It isn't going to last because because of how I began the program. Because of these these youths, you understand? Do you understand that when I began going up to the Temple Mount in 1987? 
there were, what, I don't know, half a dozen people going up to the Temple Mount. I do not recognize or know by name all of the people that were, that were standing online to go up to the Temple Mount, a thousand people on Tisha B'Av that got up as early as I did or much earlier to make their way to Jerusalem to go up to the Temple Mount. It is, it is here to stay. And the, and the very fact that on Tisha B'Av, instead of just sitting and mourning and wailing and reciting the prayers that seem to indicate that we're waiting for God to do something and, and, nothing, and nothing further, and that we have no connection to this, instead of doing that, but, but instead seeing young people led by their rabbis, by the way, there were many very prominent educators, rabbis, community leaders, deans of schools that came to the Temple Mount on Tisha B'Av, saying, no, this is not the right message, just mourning. The message is, let's go. Let's go there. Let's show that this is important to us, and let's investigate exactly how to go according to the biblical law, according to Jewish law, in purity, and let's go make sure that we're going to the right place, and let's go and let's say, this has got to stop this terrible cycle of mourning. Did you mention, Rabbi, the university students and the broadcast? Uh, I believe broadcast. I did mention that, but let's go. Let's let's f- go further into that. That was the most amazing thing, that th- these uh, these fellows set up a live stream, uh, some something on the internet that everybody that was there was able to log in to a, an address, and with their with their phones, they were able to contribute different angles of of what was going on in the Temple Mount, and there were amazing amounts of people that were logged in watching. What was going on on the Temple Mount on Tisha B'Av? These things can't be hidden anymore. Uh, the police can't get away with it anymore. And the government can't get away with it anymore. The government can't get away with it anymore. And, and by the way, as soon as I came down from the Temple Mount, uh, and again, I was there very early, and I got to, go, got to go up in the first group, in the second group, who came but none other than Israel's Minister of Agriculture, Ori Ariel. A Kohen. A Kohen who wants to serve in the Holy Temple. And by the way, in the last Knesset, uh, he also was a minister. He was the minister of building, of construction, and he made some headlines when on the very first day in the last uh, Knesset that he entered into the Knesset and from his, the chambers of his ministry, of the Ministry of Construction, he said, yeah, I'd like to be building the Holy Temple. And everyone was like, oh, oh, how could you say that? Oh, 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 how irresponsible. What are you trying to do here? You're trying to uh, bring up about a world war. You know what? Enough is enough. The only, the only world war that's being brought up here, that's being brought about, is the one that's been instigated by Obama and by his cohorts, who have brought the most dangerous regime in modern in in modern history modern meaning our time right now this generation they have brought that regime to the mikveh they have immersed that that regime and it has come out a a saint pure as the driven snow uh, some virgin i don't know exactly it's come out something absolutely immaculate and it is uh, and, and what did I read today? Iran is talking about <laughs> opening up uh, uh, um, direct, flights. Di- direct flights to America. You guys are going to be best friends. I- the very same day that the, that the, that the nuclear deal was uh, passed, they were dancing in the streets in Iran and burning American flags and calling America the great Satan and how we did one to them and how we're going to do all this and how there's not going to be any such thing as on-site inspections. And even Kerry said that that's just a fantasy and how when Kerry heard about all the things that, are, that they're saying in Iran, he <laughs> I'm sorry, I did this last week and laughed. He said, that's very disturbing if it's true. Well, you know what? Here's the thing. This deal is a very terrible deal. It enables Iran to become a nuclear power. Whatever you heard about it that that says that it's wonderful uh, is a lie. Have you read the details? Have you read about the 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 complicity of America to destroy Israel? How there are clauses in the deal that guarantee America's aid, um, uh, that America will come to Iran's aid if Israel tries to do anything to defend itself. Um, the the deal I- it already is resulting in billions of dollars and um, a European euros being poured into the Iranian economy. Iran, uh, this is a fact, um, and its proxies sponsor uh, terror 
all over the world. And the very proof that what I'm saying is correct and isn't just some sort of Jewish neurosis is that Iran's Muslim neighbors are very concerned. Why is Saudi Arabia so concerned? Why does Saudi Arabia feel that America has thrown it under the bus? The situation is more than um, ridiculous. And the bottom line of it all is that it's not that Israel's being put, placed in danger is a byproduct. Listen carefully. It's not that Israel being thrown under the bus and, well, that's just not our priority. That's just not the West priority. It's not that Israel being placed in danger is a byproduct of the deal. This was the purpose of the deal. This was the purpose of the deal because Obama is uh, committed to the destruction of the state of Israel and the fact that he is enabled by Jewish Democrats is not even a question. It's the fact that he is enabled by um, misled um, and naive and self-hating Jews uh, is unfortunate, but it's just another cog and another facet manifestation of Jewish history. Um, and while other uh, while other commentators or you know people can talk in the same vein and they can be very frustrated and they can be very morbid and say you know Israel is going to be destroyed Israel is has now been totally compromised that isn't my perspective at all my perspective is that this is the best thing that could possibly happen because eventually um, the, our leadership either this one or true Jewish leadership that will emerge as a result of, uh, of necessity, uh, true Jewish leadership will rise up and say, you know what, enough is enough. We're, we're going to take care of ourselves and do whatever it is that we need to do. And that is so wonderful and healthy. And that break and all these people that write to us and that say, oh, you're talking so highfalutin, but you wouldn't survive without American military aid. You wouldn't survive without America. You wouldn't survive. You know what, do me a favor, take it and have a nice day. <laughs> Put it where the sun don't shine. We would be so much better off. You think we can't do it. You think we don't have the ingenuity. Do you know how many times America vetoed and destroyed projects that Israel... Do you ever hear of the Levi? Did you ever hear of the Israeli fighter? Do you have any idea how many projects and military innovations we came up with that were that were uh, either canceled or, v or vetoed or stopped by America because they don't want us to be independent, because they don't want us to have uh, the, the right to defend ourselves. And all the American military aid that you hear about all the time that America forces us to spend on American military aid while always giving the Egyptians and the Saudis and others just a grade or two or three above what they're giving us and the fact that they don't, e don't even allow us to adapt the, the military hardware and the fighter planes to our conditions but only in the midst of war then they give us instruction but we can't even in other words our wings are totally clipped by um, by America's um, wonderful love for the Jewish state and now at least we have a, p a man in the White House who, if that's what he is, who has officially taken off the mask and basically made it clear that his goal is to destroy Israel. But don't feel bad because his actual goal is also to destroy America, which <laughs> he's doing a very good jo a job at. And so, hey, like we always say, it's all coming to a theater near you, but actually it's already been played wherever you live. Um, it's about the total empowerment of what is referred to, at least by, by people who aren't afraid to say it, Muslim extremism, extremism, but of course there is no such thing. It's not extreme, it's Islam. That's how Islam works, that's what it's all about, and who knows better than us? It's all emanating like ripple effect from the Temple Mount. How goes the Temple Mount is how goes our nation and our people, but also how goes the whole world. And so by allowing terror to exist, by allowing the, the, the um, spectacle of, of um, the power, the evil power of Islam to flourish, this is the result. And so no, I'm not worried about the existence of Israel. I gave up on the existence of America a long time ago. But don't worry, we will be in a position where we will just simply have to do exactly what we have to do 
And you know what? I don't think that God changed his mind. I know that we have a lot of promises here in the Holy Torah and here in this week's Torah portion, the Parsha, where we have Moshe praying to be able to come into the land of Israel, the Parsha where we have this, such a beautiful synthesis between Torah and prayer because we have the Ten Commandments and we also have Shema Yisrael. Listen to what I read here in this week's Torah portion. It says, See, I have taught you decrees and ordinances as Hashem my God has commanded me to do so in the midst of the land to which you come to possess it. So Moses is saying this is the purpose of Torah and the commandments to come and do it in the land. You shall safeguard and perform them for it is your wisdom and discernment in the eyes of the peoples who shall hear all these decrees and who shall say surely a wise and discerning people is this great nation for which is a great nation that has a God who is close to it as is Hashem our God whenever we call to him and which is a great nation that has righteous decrees and ordinances such as his entire this entire Torah that I place before you this day. In other words, what are we supposed to say to the nations? The, what are the nations supposed to, supposed to say? They're supposed to say, wow, look at those people in the land of Israel. They are living according to the word of their God. So as opposed to a government which is secular and which is godless and which is ashamed of our ide identity, trying to act like other nations, Moses is saying to his people before he takes leave of them, look, I taught you these Torahs, I taught you this mitzvah, so that when you come into the land you do it, guess what? When you safeguard and perform it, it is your wisdom and discernment in the eyes of the, of the peoples. The peoples are gonna say, whoa, step back. The Jews are home, they're so wise. And they're gonna say, whoa, this is how they're existing because Look how, they're, look how they follow the decrees of their God. Who, surely a wise and discerning people is this great nation. Did you ever, the, the nations are going to say to each other, did you ever hear of a great nation that has a God who's close to it, as is Hashem our God, whenever we call to Him? Get it? We're not calling to Congress. We're not calling to, to uh, the ADL. We're calling to God. Whenever we call to Him, He is close to us. And that is the secret of Jewish survival. So all of these, all of these, um, uh, woe begone, um, you know, um, specters, whether they are Obama or Iran, you know what? Have yourself a nice day, but we're not going anywhere. We're here to stay. And in fact, Temple Talk is coming right back, so don't move. We'll be right back. Temple Talk. Today is the 12th day of the month of Av, Menachem Av, Comforting Father, 5775. It is the 28th day of the month of July, 2015. Rabbi, you've been talking about uh, Tisha B'Av on Sunday, the 9th of Av. was also the day that uh, we released a video that uh, gives everybody a glimpse into the architectural plans that we have been drafting, professionally of course, uh, of the sanctuary, the Echal, the Holy Temple itself, which of course one year ago, we ran a campaign, Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign to raise money uh, to, to be able to uh, uh, afford these plans. And yep, we came through, we have, uh, we have the plans, they're still being, uh, complete it. I think they're very near completion now, but uh, we put together this video to give everybody a glimpse into the plans and into a, a computer, um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, 3D, 3D tour. 3D imaging of the, of the uh, Holy Temple. And we first posted it, made it public on Sunday, and as of this recording, um, I think it has over 93,000 uh, views on YouTube on alone. YouTube it's coming very close to a hundred thousand views it probably will be by the end of today but the amazing thing is that on Facebook which is a different system it's like on Facebook it's as it's seen on Facebook it is well over 
a million and a quarter mm -hmm. views already, and uh, it's generating a lot of excitement. And this is not just another virtual tour of the temple, as there are a number of those around. This is actually based on the actual detailed plans, the building plans that the architect is working on that includes the materials from which the structure is constructed that are available today. It's very, very specific, <coughs> the few moments of uh, that we're able to see there. But as you mentioned, <coughs> the entire uh, project is still underway. The architects are working on the program. We're going to be receiving a great deal of detailed information uh, very soon that will also make public. And this is all part of, th of that program that you mentioned, which actually began a number of years ago. Those that have been following the Temple Institute for some time will recall that a number of years ago we released uh, another video which is uh, based on the architectural conception of a particular chamber in the Holy Temple. And that's where we began our program of what I might call modernization, our program of actually um, developing the architectural operational plans for the Holy Temple and then translating them into uh, video images as well. We began with something called the Lishkata Gazit, which is the chamber of hewn stone, which is a particular chamber that is described in the sources of Jewish knowledge and tradition, such as the Mishnah. talks about the chamber wherein sat, dwelled the Sanhedrin, the court of Israel in the Holy Temple. And that uh, also um, went viral, was seen by many people, and now we are continuing or we began to continue uh, the program about a year ago with that first Indiegogo campaign to finance the entire structure of the Holy Temple, working now on the Heichal, the sanctuary, and the video that you m described just went up on Sunday. We actually uh, announced it to the press on the ninth day of Av as a, a, an important statement Again, that's the day that the uh, eyes of the whole nation of Israel are turned towards temple consciousness. There are those that view the ninth of Av as a day of perpetual mourning, as a day when we reflect on our own impotence, as a day when we recall that we don't have the temple and that's all there is to it until God makes some sort of change. And then there is the attitude of many, many other uh, f factors uh, within Israel and most notably represented by the position of the Temple Institute, which is that it is up to us to bring about a change, to do something about the situation, to begin the building of the Holy Temple, and thus we found it to be extremely potent um, that we release these plans, that we notify the world that this is going on on the ninth of Av as a tikkun, as a rectification, as a fixing, as a <coughs> as a response to the to end the the cycle of mourning and grief. And the only way that will end is by action, is by doing. I'd like to just add, Rabbi, that the architect who is overseeing the the program, the plans being drafted up, is also a, a Torah scholar and has has focused his scholarship on this particular subject for, for many, many, many years. Uh, so he has come to the table with a familiarity with the, the various uh, problems. Uh, He's in a very uh, unique situation because not only is he an extremely accomplished architect whose work is in high demand here in Israel and abroad, I believe, but he brings to the drafting table an immense knowledge of Torah sources and thus he has been able to actually um, find unique uh, and innovative solutions to many halachic questions that are debated by our sages about how exactly this or that aspect of the structure is to go. So it's really amazing that he's been able to rectify a lot of misunderstanding in an actual plan for building the temple, as it were, today, as it should be today. In fact, at the 34th Annual Temple uh, Research Conference that was held on the 29th day of the month of Tammuz, which was 
um, a couple of weeks ago, just before uh, the, the eve of Rosh Chodesh Av, um, he spoke uh, at that conference and he unveiled some of these materials there as well. And of course, the majority of that conference was dedicated to the very innovative halachic research regarding the red heifer. The red heifer is the major project that we are working on as we speak. This summer, the major goal of the Temple Institute is to solidify and establish its program to raise a herd of red cattle here in Israel from which can be um, selected the proper biblically mandated candidate for a real red heifer. And that also we uh, want to take this opportunity to express the deepest appreciation and esteem for those that are coming forward and helping to support this project. There are tremendous expenses involved and we are um, quite uh, occupied, busy with uh, the progress of this program and um, I can take this opportunity to mention a number of things that, um, that are important to clarify regarding this program. Again, the fact that there's a very big difference between red cattle and red heifers, kosher red heifers. There are many, many red, red colored cattle in the world of different breeds. And the one which according to the research of the scholars and experts best fits the qualifications for a suitable candidate for a kosher red heifer is indeed red angus. The program involves the, the development of this herd here in Israel. We are using uh, the, the technology of uh, implantation of, of frozen embryos here in domestic Israeli cattle for that. That has met, been met with uh, absolute um, rabbinical approbation and approval um, for this program. Some people have asked, is that halachic? Is that biblical? Is that is that messing with God? Is that messing with nature? How are you allowed to do that? The fact is, no less a Torah scholar than the universally esteemed and highly beloved and respected Rabbi Mordechai Eliyahu of blessed memory, the former chief rabbi of the state of Israel, was a great proponent and enthusiast he, he, of this program. He, uh, many years ago, um, was extremely supportive of the efforts to raise red heifers here in Israel through embryo implantation. And of course, the scholars of the Institute, uh, working, working with great scholars of the generation, have developed a halachic um, <coughs> approach to this concept. So the first goal is to successfully raise these cattle here in Israel, and then to select a proper candidate for the red heifer that will in, that will involve tremendous amount of planning, supervision, adaptation uh, of infrastructure, things that have to be done in a modern ranch today in order to safely, halakhically, properly uh, raise a red heifer. There never has been, since the era, the era of the Second Temple, there has never been a proper kosher red heifer anywhere. If I may just for Which a moment, Which is the Rabbi distinction, Yitzhak, yeah. the distinction between all of those reports of red heifers, mm -hmm. even recent, they even were, they recently, were candidates. that have been born here and there, that have generated so much enthusiasm and excitement here and there. Oh, there's a red heifer, there's a red heifer. In D New Jersey, there was a red heifer born. In Arkansas, there was a red heifer born. What they were was that they were red cattle that had a, a very good chance of becoming red heifers, but in the end, they were disqualified. And that's because in order to ensure properly that they maintain their status, you have to put a lot of effort into it. It is not automatic. But we believe that all of the Torah's commandments are within reach, are doable. And the commandment of the red heifer, like every other commandment pertaining to the building of the Holy Temple, is no different. I would just like to uh, mention, Rabbi, to refer to our campaign uh, that we're conducting right now to raise money to fund this program that in the two weeks since we began the campaign, over 360 people have participated. Uh, we've reached almost a quarter of our, of our goal, and uh, certainly uh, like to express our appreciation uh, to all those who have participated, and call on you, our listeners, to participate as well. Be part of this historic project, and again, the 
the, uh, the red heifer is every bit an intrinsic aspect of the building of the Holy Temple, as are the architectural plans. Uh, Absolutely, there are actually one can't two, two prongs of one, of, one idea, of one concept, because the, a prerequisite for the building is the process of purification through the heifer. So this is way, way a priority for all those for whom the concept of the Holy Temple is holy and real. Again, it's about being real. And it's about being in this world. Nothing's going to happen by itself. And that's the lesson of Tisha B'Av. So this week, this week's Torah portion is the amazingly beautiful Parshat Ve'etchanan, which begins with Moshe's review of his prayer that he offered to the Almighty to be allowed to come into the land of Israel. According to tradition, he actually offered 515 prayers, which is the numerical value of the word Ve'etchanan. And, and I, I, I implored Hashem at that time. And... Um, what did he mention in the prayer that's mentioned that, that's mentioned here in these verses? He said, "Let me now cross and see the good land that is on the other side of the Jordan, this good mountain, and the Lebanon." And that sounds very beautiful, very Levantine, <laughs> very <laughs> Middle Eastern, very prosaic. But actually, our holy tradition is that Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses here, was specifically referring to none other than Jerusalem and the Holy Temple. And um, that's what he was saying. He was saying, I, w I would give my life. I w I'm begging you, let me come in and see Jerusalem and let me see the building of the temple because the good mountain here is a reference to Jerusalem and the Lebanon is a reference to the Holy Temple. That Lebanon is a word that's also used in the Song of Songs. It's a code and it refers to the Holy Temple. Why? You may ask. And, and I do. And let, you may answer. Well, I would posit a few reasons, Rabbi. One is because uh, much uh, wood from the cedars of Lebanon was used in the Holy Temple, but also because Le Lebanon I is from the same word, the root, as Levona, uh, which is which is the um, frankincense used in the incense, and also Levan, which is white which is the purifying factor of the... So the, the, the wood aspect and the levona, the frankincense aspect, are two very beautiful uh, thoughts that I actually hadn't even considered. What Rashi mentions, of course, is the, your, your, third, your third point, which is that the root of Lebanon is, Le is Levan, and that the Holy Temple is referred to um, in the diminutive as Lebanon, because it is the whitener. It whitens. It whitens the sins of a person. So it's called the Lebanon. And how beautiful that we always read this parsha, the Etchanan, and the week immediately, the week of, of Tisha B'Av. So that... In fact, this is called the Sabbath of Consolation. And, and this is the... And, this is this, and, and Moshe Rabbeinu was praying that he will see this... he see this building. That he'll see it happen. And I firmly believe that uh, that his prayers are are active and are still being uh, presented before God this day. And uh, it's up to us to uh, help uh, bring that into fruition. And not only that, but no prayer goes unanswered. And um, this Parsha, which is such a beautiful synthesis of, of Torah and Tefillah, Torah and prayer, um, you know that the sages teach that ultimately Moses is going to be coming into the land of Israel in the future with that very generation. So he, he definitely has his answer. The, this Shabbat is called the Shabbat of Consolation. It actually takes its name from the first words of the prophetic reading, the mm -hmm. Haftarah, that are going to be read uh, this Shabbat that comes from Isaiah, the beginning of chapter 40 where we read, Nachamu, Nachamu Ami, comfort, comfort my people. And um, this begins actually a period of seven weeks leading up to Rosh Hashanah that are called the seven weeks of consolation. When the message in all of the prophetic readings of these ensuing Sabbaths is a message of consolation and consolation. And we've begun now a spiritual... Um, ascent? Ascent, yes, a spiritual pro uh, progression into the High Holy Days. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I must point out that this Friday, again, is called the 15th of Av. It is a holiday um, which is um, unsung, but in the recent years, it's become more popular in Israel. Um, it has the bare bones of the, of the, of the um, DNA footprint of a holiday in that we don't recite, uh, let's say, the Tachonon prayers. We don't, we don't recite the prayers that are associated with, uh, with harshness on that day. It has like minor aspects of a holiday. But in the time of the Holy Temple, state our sages, it was the major holiday of the year together with Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur was considered to be the most joyous day of the year, the Day of Atonement, not as we view it today, somber and uh, heavy. It was considered to be so joyous because it's the day that God granted atonement and forgiveness to his people as a promise. And the sister, the twin of Yom Kippur, is the 15th day of Av. On both days, the daughters of Jerusalem, according to the source, the Mishnah would go out and dance in the fields in borrowed white gowns. Each one would borrow one from the another so that not to embarrass one that didn't have, and they would um, dance in circles in the field. In the fields, so there's a, an aspect of of a circularness to Tubav. In fact, Tu Ba'av, which stands for the 15th day of the month of Av, uh, the 15th letter of the Aleph Bet, if you look at what we're writing here, Tu Ba'av, it's like saying the 15th of the Aleph Bet mm -hmm. is the Samach. The Samach is completely a circle. a circle. And that has to do with this concept of our unity, that when you're standing in a circle, nobody's on the top, nobody's on the bottom, mm -hmm. everyone is completely equal. Again, a rectification of the a baseless hatred of, as it were, of uh, the Second Temple destruction whole trip kind mm -hmm. of thing. And the idea, though, of the 15th of Av, it's a very amazing holiday because a number of things occurred on that day. First and foremost in history, that is the very day upon which the decree of God against the generation that had been dying out in the wilderness, the generation that accepted the evil speech of, this, of the spies, they stopped dying on that day. They stopped dying and prophecy came back into the world and m other uh, events happened throughout history. For example, uh, when Betar, the last stronghold against the, Ro the Roman occupation, was destroyed um, and the Romans made a decree that the, the Jews could not bury the dead of the city of Betar and they were, their bodies were left out for a number of years when finally permission was granted by Rome for the Jews to return to Beitar and bury the dead, they found miraculously that their comrades had been totally preserved as like the day that they were killed, and, and it was seen as a very great sign of God's compassion. A number of events occurred on the 15th day of Av. They're all discussed in the Talmud and Tractate Ta'anit. But what they all bespeak is a certain level of very deep connection, even intimacy, between Israel and God. Do you know... Yitzchak, that mm -hmm. according to sources, the Talmud seems to indicate that in temple times, for example, in the time of the Second Temple, right, after the return from the first exile, there was a week-long holiday in the Holy Temple, which began on the mm -hmm. ninth of Av, of course. which was not a fast day, and continued and crescendoed with the 15th day mm -hmm. of Av. And again, there is a very beautiful uh, literature um, in the writings of the, of the holy Rabbi Tzadok of Lublin uh, and he actually, Rabbi Tzadok of Kohen in the Preet Tzadik, he actually writes that and he proves through all sorts of tradition that the 15th day of the month of Av, as far as he's concerned is the day upon which the third temple will be rebuilt mm. it's definitely a third temple day, now of course I'd be perfectly happy for it to be built one day in the middle of, uh, I don't know, Tevet or uh, Adar or any, any old time is good. But it's very, very beautiful uh, to examine this tradition and study it. And the main thing is, when we consider the indefatigable character of, of the Jewish psyche, that literally a week after we're sitting on the floor at the lowest points, we rise up and we have this tremendous festival of joy and understanding how everything is good, everything comes from Hashem, everything is 
part of the plan. And if the temple was destroyed, it's only because the temple is going to be rebuilt and it's going to be rebuilt better than ever. And Hashem's presence is going to be better known and, w and perfectly known uh, in the eyes of all mankind, as, as the prophets tell us. And so to me, and I've, I've taught this uh, consistently, the ultimate expression of this cycle from the 9th of Av to the 15th of Av, which is this Friday, um, which expresses this tremendous um, joy of living, is Psalm 30, wherein we read, You have transformed my lament into dancing. You have undid my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. That's the progression from mourning to joy from Tisha B'Av to the 15th day of Av. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you all for listening, and I uh, encourage everybody to uh, watch our videos that we've been posting, uh, cover, covering uh, what's happening in Temple Mount, covering our architectural plans for the Third Holy Temple, covering our project with the Red Heifer. Please uh, stay on top of things, and we'll be back next week. Temple Talk.